man, or perhaps I should say the creature you have just seen is one of the strangest characters who ever roamed the hills of Connecticut. Today we trace the life and legend of the old leather man here on Perception. And my guest is one of the few authorities on the old leather man, Mr. Mark Haber of Wethersfield. Mr. Haber, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I know the questions that are coming to mind are these. Who was the old leather man? Why was he called the old leather man? Let's begin with the who. Well, the leather man was a celebrated wandering hermit who aroused the curiosity of the people during the period when he wandered through, through Connecticut and New York State for a period of 27 years from 1862 to 1889, which was the year of his death, he covered a circuit of 366 miles through Connecticut and New York State, approximately 246 miles in Connecticut and about 140 miles in New York State. Now, why the old leather man? He was dressed in a leather suit which he made himself from old boot, boot tops. A, a gigantic coat which reached down to his knees and, uh, and leather trousers and, uh, and he made his own shoes uh, of leather and wooden soles and a leather, a leather cap, leather hat with a visor. And uh, where did he get his leather from? He picked up his bits of leather wherever he could find them. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly all boot tops. This is his uh, bag in which he carried bits of leather. That's right. Perhaps some papers, occasionally This was some his food. bag, yes. This was his bag in which he carried pieces of leather which he always looked for and was very happy to find. And this is made of old boot tops. Uh, and uh, he carried this bag which must have weighed, uh, after when it was filled, I'm sure it must have weighed 10 or 15 pounds, plus his suit. His suit weighed 60 pounds, his shoes 10 pounds, and he, he toted uh, at least close to 100 pounds around with him all the time. Why don't we trace the route of this traveling hermit? Mm -hmm. And uh, it will show graphically just where he went. This was drawn by Lewis H. Hertz of Bristol, and I understand Mr. Hertz is in the process of writing a book uh, on the Mr. life Hertz of the old leather man. Mr. Hertz is from Scarsdale, New York, uh -huh. a very close and dear friend of mine, uh, with whom I uh, traveled uh, and, and uh, investigated many of the huts and caves about 25 years ago that the leather man lived in. And uh, we, he compiled quite a, a good deal of hitherto unknown material, which he has incorporated in his book, which he is about to publish. Now, these uh, outlines that we have here are based on articles which appeared in newspapers at the time of the old leather man's travels. And we begin in this general area. In this general here. area right here around Harwinton uh, and Burlington. In this area, he traveled south to Berlin and down along the, the Connecticut River, right down this area, right down through here to Saybrook, and then to Clinton, and circumvented New Haven, always circumvented the large cities, mm -hmm. also circumvented Bridgeport, to New Canaan. There he crossed the New York State border to Mount Pleasant, and then continued north as far as Peekskill. And he turned east again to Yorktown, Brewster, and crossed the border here to New Fairfield, and then all the way up again to Plymouth, to Purgatory, Purgatory, Thomaston, Plymouth, and so completed his circuit. Well, that is quite a circuit, 366 miles in 34 days. And I understand that uh, Farmers used to say they could set their watches by him <laughs> by, because of his regularity. Yes, uh, that is, uh, some of the reports about him uh, uh, are such. Uh, some farmers, uh, it is stated that some farmers did set 
their watches almost by his regularity. He was very regular. Now, where did he stay? Where did he live? He lived in, uh, in caves along the route or not far from his route. And he also built uh, huts, lean-tos, uh, more or less, uh, from overhanging cliff, some, some overhanging ledge that he would find and then build uh, uprights and cover it with leaves and sticks and brush and what have you. And that's how he lived. And uh, during the winter, he would uh, light a fire so as to heat the overhanging rock mm -hmm. to a degree that would, it would keep him warm during the night. He had almost the cunning of an animal then. He really needed the cunning of an oh, animal in yes. order to survive. He, he knew the forest. And he lived a very, very rugged life. Now, what did he do, let's say, for food, for drink? Well, drink was no problem. He knew, I'm sure, he knew his places where he could get water. Uh, there were plenty of uh, brooks and so forth. Uh, that was no problem. Uh, as far as food is concerned, he was fed uh, by the, in the various towns that he visited. The people always knew exactly approximately when he was coming. In fact, they would set the food out on the lawn for him on a table. In fact, I think we have a photo showing that. And didn't the women used to bar the, the, the shutters? Oh, the... yes, in the outlying sections, not in the towns themselves, but in the outlying sections, the women would usually bar their windows and lock their doors and peek out behind the curtains. Uh, just, uh, they knew just about when he was coming, but they were rather very, they were very much afraid of him. He was a rather fierce-looking uh, gentleman. He had a very swarthy complexion. And, of course, the rugged existence that he led uh, gave him a rather fierce-looking countenance, you know. But although very shy, he uh, was not a violent character. He was not a violent character. He was shy of people. He, uh, he did not want to be closed in or... Uh, he, he never went inside and into any home except in the latter years when he was ill. But. Uh, uh, he wanted to stay outdoors, outdoors. He didn't want to become involved with people to that extent that he would be invited indoors, evidently. Did he uh, ever speak? He spoke very, very little. Uh, as a matter of fact, the amount of talking that he did amounted to nothing. Yeah, it was just a little, a grunt. Uh, he was known to, uh, to say, yeah, uh, we oui, or non in French. He was a Frenchman. And this brings us to the legend part he of the He was story. a Frenchman. And he understood French, uh, more so than English. He, he did speak some broken English, according to reports. What is the legend of the old leather man? Well, the legend of the old leather man amounts to uh, the fact that uh, he was born, or he lived, in Lyon, France. A gentleman by the name and he fell in love with a, a wealthy leather merchant's daughter who was mm -hmm. very beautiful. This uh, wealthy leather merchant by the name of Laurent uh, was not uh, agreeable to this marriage. And uh, Bourglay, Jules Bourglay, <coughs> which was his name, finally prevailed upon Mr. Laron to allow him to prove himself as a good businessman and uh, uh, in that way win the hand of his daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Laron took him into his business and unfortunately there was a panic uh, in the leather market around 1857 and Jules Bourglay had speculated for the firm in leather and uh, this uh, disaster in, le in the leather market caused the uh, uh, a great loss a tremendous loss to mr laron and of course jules bourglay lost the hand of his daughter and he became more or less demented he roamed around the streets of Lyon, and then he was found in paris he was uh, in an asylum they say for approximately two years and the next thing we know he was found in the United States ro roaming around in the wilds of Connecticut and New York State. Now, if he never spoke, how did the legend evolve? 
Well, the legend evolved by uh, someone who found some records of this nature in one of his caves. So the story goes. Now, whether it's fact or whether it's legend, we don't know. Mm -hmm. now, in the latter years of his life, he developed cancer of the lip, and this eventually took his life. There are some rather interesting sidelights connected even with this, because I understand that at one time they wanted to hospitalize him, and did. That's right. Uh, the Connecticut Humane, uh, Humane Society was prevailed upon by some of the citizens of uh, Forestville and Bristol uh, to uh, pick him up and take him to the Hartford Hospital. He was picked up, and they prevailed upon him to come with him, and he was taken to the Hartford Hospital. Uh, there, uh, uh, he, they were only able to keep him there for about one hour, mm -hmm. and out he went. And of course, they had no legal way of actually keeping him there. Actually, by that time, the cancer had uh, oh, the cancer. to the point where oh, it was yes. not There was nothing operable. could be done. His jaw was half eaten away, and uh, he was in a miserable state. No, he lived through the blizzard of 88, didn't he? He did, yes. He lived through the blizzard of 88. And uh, yes, that was the only time, according to the records, that he actually went inside of a home. He was, uh, people uh, really, uh, aroused the, uh, he was a pitiable object and he aroused the pity of a great many people. They tried to get him in, into a, into indoors and they never could. But during this blizzard, when he arrived in Forestville, he actually went inside of a home. I think it was the home of uh, Mr. Beach in Forestville. And uh, there he was uh, fed liquid food. He couldn't eat any solid food. And uh, they kept him there for a while. Where did he die? He died on the George Dell farm in Ossining, New York, in one of his huts. Did they find anything on him at that time which uh, would give some indication of his convictions, his thinking, did they find any books? The only thing they found was an old Bible dated about 1840 and a crucifix on his body. That's all that was found. And of course, his bag, his glove, and his uh, tobacco pouch. And uh, that's, and his, the clothing he wore. This found its way to a wax museum, I understand, on New York's Bowery, didn't it? Yes, his entire raiment, his entire garb was uh, acquired by a wax museum in, uh, in New York. There they uh, made a likeness of him in wax, a very fine likeness, and they clothed him in his clothing. And uh, it was, uh, and this is a brochure which they, which they gave to all those who came in at Mission 10 Cents the Globe Museum at 290, 298 Bowery in New York. And, Me and uh, Wilson, proprietors. <laughs> the old leather man's body is in Ossining, New York today. At Sparta, at Sparta Cemetery. Mr. Haber, I want to thank you very much for visiting with us here on Perception today and telling us the story of the old leather man. And until next week, this is Dick Bertell.